Hello, this is Georgina Rose and welcome back to the Dot Darling YouTube channel. On this channel, we discuss everything related to mysticism, magic, the occult, and everything on the fringe of Soterica. And in this video, I'm going to be giving a topic that I have never really gotten into, but I think it is quite relevant. And that would be, what should you actually wear during ritual? Does it matter what you wear? And why do people in different traditions seem to wear really different things for spiritual reasons. So obviously, uh, dressing up for ritual is not like, um, you know, putting on a little witch hat or whatever. No, it's actually pretty complicated. And it's going to really depend on what you are actually doing. Because there are a lot of elements in what you wear during ritual that you can change. Every single facet and thing that exists within your ritual space is a correspondence, whether you're aware of it or not. Because when we are in ritual, we are creating a microcosm or a small space that will then impact the macrocosm or the big space. So literally every single thing in that space is going to impact the larger thing. And so obviously what's on our bodies when we are the people channeling the spirits, channeling those energies and bringing them into the microcosm does matter. Now, you don't necessarily need to do something super lavish, though sometimes that can be really helpful. But regardless of that, it's good to consider it and really think, hmm, what am I wearing? Because certain garments actually can elevate your ritual and take it to the next level. It can show, you know, if you are to say, put a veil on your head, it shows a level of humbleness. Um, and much like you would veil an altar and put a tablecloth on it before working on it, you are veiling yourself, marking yourself as sacred. Or you could wear a specific talisman or layman that conveys a specific symbol that you might actually need to do the ritual itself. So let's get into it. The first thing to consider when deciding what to wear for ritual is going to be the correspondence of the garments itself. Specifically, I think the first thing to consider is color because obviously for some people they don't have just like a closet full of really cool ritual robes and talismanic shirts lying around. And so the first thing to consider is what color are you wearing and what does it mean, right? Let's take a look at what I'm wearing. I, I wouldn't wear this for ritual, but let's say I did, right? Like, let's say I was in a pinch and I needed to get something done. So I'm wearing white. White is a color of purity. It's sort of a, you know, kind of neutral color. Um, I think white is really good in ritual if you're, you know, once again, trying to signify purity. Um, and then I'm also wearing black. Black obviously corresponds to um, Saturn, but it also can be very protective. So think about it, like what are the colors I'm wearing corresponding to based on their planetary correspondence? Because as we know, Sun, the Moon, Mars, they all have specific colors to them and those all further have correspondences to them. And so wearing say black could really infuse a Saturnine energy into your Saturn ritual and really immediately take it to the next level. Um, as well, whatever jewelry you're wearing, those metals have specific correspondences. A lot of the old grimoires, when they have you make talismans, they often have you make the talismans in specific materials and metals. And that is because all of those metals have a level of correspondence to them. As well, whatever stones you're wearing, that is once again a layer of correspondence because all stones kind of have meaning to them, right? I'm wearing pearls. Uh, pearls correlate to Venus. As we know, when Venus was born out of the water, she was born, you know, sort of out of this like shell. And it's, 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 pearls are very her, right? Because they connect to the sea. As well, wearing a pearl could infuse the water element into you. Because as we know, the classical elements, which are foundational building blocks of Western correspondence, all have, you know, specific things that are connected to them that can infuse that energy in. And now, you know, now you have that correspondence of emotionality, of intuitiveness that comes with the correspondence of water by simply wearing that pearl. Now, to get into specific ritual garments, because there are certain times where you will want an actual, like, specific garment built to be in ritual, um, I think we should start with the most, like, well-known ritual garment and one that's kind of been sensationalized in the media and in movies, and that would be the robe. So I think we all have images of occultists wearing robes like in our heads when we think of esotericism. And that does exist in real life. But the thing is, it's done in a number of different ways. Um, obviously, in certain Christian mystical traditions that obligate the practitioner to be a priest or something, you're obviously obligated to wear church vestments and priest robes, um, right? But for some other rituals, you will have to wear just a regular robe. The most common robe that you see in Western esotericism, specifically, any tradition that breaks off of that kind of Hermeticism tree, this would be the Golden Dawn, this would be Thelema, and to some extent certain forms of like Wicca and whatnot, you're going to have the specific robe called the Tau robe. It's called the Tau robe because it's shaped like, it's shaped like a T, 
right? Like it's like, um, you got the arms and they dangle, like the sleeves, I actually wore this dress to try to visualize it. See, the sleeves have a big drop to them, right? There's a big drooping going on, which by the way, can become a massive fire hazard. So be careful when you're wearing these. Um, and these, depending on sort of what tradition you're part of, are in different colors. Um, and within some traditions, as you sort of advance through degrees or through um, some sort of like journey, the way they appear changes, right? Some take on patches, some take on sashes, some takes on waist belts. So the Tao itself is a very simple garment. Um, they're pretty easy to like make yourself. They're not very complicated, but how they exactly look can really change. Um, a lot of them have been saved and curated into various museums that cover the mystical and the esoteric. So a lot of them, um, you can actually view online and see what they might have looked like because you will see a lot of variants. Another thing that goes into um, certain ritual wear is going to be the use of stoles, sashes, belts, all this stuff. Essentially things that you like sling over your body in some way. It's some sort of form of fabric, whether it's like a waist belt that you're tying on or a sash over your shoulder or stoles coming forward. Basically garments that kind of throw over you. Um, often these are called for for specific rituals and they are ways to make a like a simple robe that you use for everything have a lot more variance to them, right? A lot of people have these stoles like with um, the different planetary insignias and sigils. So you'll have your like basic white robe that you're wearing for all your rituals. And then you'll also have this stole that's say bright yellow and then it has the sigil for the sun on it, right? So then you throw that on and instantly you've got a new ritual thing without having to create a whole new thing. As well, there are certain times when belts will be called for. Um, in the Keys of Solomon, one of the most iconic grimoire magic texts in, I think, Western history, um, and yes, that is where the Goetia comes from, it obligates people to wear a lion skin belt, like basically a fur belt. Um, and this is to denote kingship and power, right, and represent that thing. As well, you'll notice in some other traditions, the use of animal furs and skins comes up a lot in rituals. Specifically in the Nordic tradition, you will see the use of um, various uh, furs and pelts uh, being thrown on the ritualist to infuse the energy of, say, that animal's spirit into the ritual or to do some sort of traditional rite. So keep all that in mind. And sometimes you will see the use of mask, um, like certain animal masks for shamanic traditions, all those kind of traditions who heavily involve those animal totemic type spirits will use little mask. Um, and the belt is one you're going to see in the West. Um, one interesting thing in a lot of the more modern Western traditions is they hold the idea that a female practitioner could do the role of a male practitioner in a pinch if there's like a sort of emergency, not ideally, it's not, but it can be done um, by wearing a belt and attaching a sword to it to represent that fire phallic element that a woman, just based on biology, is simply going to lack. Um, so you'll see people kind of throwing a sling over their waist and then dropping in a, a sort of sword or dagger of sorts. Um, and in other rituals that don't actually relate to that concept at all, you will see like an obligation to wear a sword. There's a number of traditions that have people do this at various points in time. And a lot of people do that by slinging a belt over themselves because a sword is a great representation of the fire element. And certain war spirits really connect to the imagery of a sword. And so a sword can come into play a ton of different times. And you look at the list of like, ritual tools. The sword's a pretty consistent one. Um, in the east, you're obviously going to see kind of a curved sword, whereas in the west, it's going to be a lot straighter. But this idea is pretty consistent. Really, you're going to see used a lot in rituals, and this is going to be in a ton of different forms. It's going to be the use of layman's, talisman seals, basically sigils themselves put on your body in some way, shape, or form. Now, a lot of them are done by you actually going through a process where you'll read the grimoire, um, I'm thinking specifically of the greater key of Solomon with the pentacles. I think this is like a perfect example of it, right? So you've got the pentacles of Solomon and there's this long list of pentacles of Solomon and they correspond to all sorts of different things. There's some for every planet. There's some for like every intention you could ever want from spiritual protection to bringing in wealth, to having control over those you do business with. All sorts of things can go into these correspondences. But when you go to make one of those pentacles, you have to go through a process to create them and consecrate them. And then once they're made, you just have them, right? Now, what do you do once you have them? You obviously use them, right? You carry them in your purse, like throughout your day, right? To just have that little bit of energy and that intention follow you throughout your day. But you can also use them in a ritual that corresponds to that intention. And when you have that on, you have that around your neck, you're adding another layer of correspondence to whatever you're doing and thus infusing another energy to it. As well, there are some traditions that explicitly require you to wear sigils during it. 
Um, there's a specific grimoire called the Black Pullet. It's one of the Western kind of grim tribe grimoires, but it's discussed a lot less. And it has these sigils in them, and a lot of people will put them on like rings or make them out of fabric. And then when they go to perform rituals from the Black Pullet, they always have these on their person. Um, there are a bunch of rituals that require this kind of thing. Um, and there's similar ideas around the world. Um, during the Ottoman Empire, there was a practice that a lot of the sort of high-ranking Ottoman officials and um, people would do where they would create these talismanic shirts. So what they would do is they would um, take like basically just a piece of fabric or paper or whatever, and they would draw like hundreds of sigils and verses from the Quran, like all over it, right? And this would represent all sorts of things, typically blocking evil sorceries in their way or physical protection um, from enemies, because we are talking about political officials during a empire that had a lot of war going on. Um, but what would happen is they would wear this as an undershirt underneath their clothing, kind of like an undergarment. Um, a lot of these have actually been preserved. Some of them are in museums and some of them are actually even for sale on the internet. I saw a ton on Etsy, which was kind of crazy to me because um, this was a very widespread practice. Some are older than others, but fundamentally like these shirts, right? It's got those sigils on it. And I think that's an interesting way to take wearing sigils. Like for me, um, at one point, this was a couple years ago, um, I had a, like a slip, you know, like an underdress that women wear. There, there are a lot of kind of like vintage nightgowns look like that. And I drew a bunch of sigils on the slip. Did not look as pretty as the Ottoman uh, talisman shirts, but it's kind of the same spirit to it, right? You're wearing the symbol. And that actually brings me to something that I've never discussed in a video. I've talked a little bit on Twitter and that'll be tattoos. I think tattoos are really relevant to this conversation. I know a lot of people specifically in my country, America, have tattoos. They're very, very common. Um, and I know occultists, specifically as a demographic, like tattoos. I've been in a ritual with you guys in person. I know a lot of you have occult tattoos. So having a sigil or occult symbol uh, tattooed on your body um, is a complicated thing, right? In some ways that can actually be pretty helpful, right? There are a lot of traditional cultures that tattooed symbols onto people. Um, I think one that I liked to bring up because I think they're so, so beautiful. Um, in Thailand, there's a big tradition of ritual tattooing where people take these long sticks and you have essentially um, like like a, like a big, a pious um, man. I believe they have to be um, a Buddhist monk, but don't question, quote me on that. Um, and they do these, these really intense tattoos, right? And it puts these sort of spirits onto your body, right? And that type of stuff is super powerful. And whatever symbol you have on your body, it's gonna affect what you're doing, right? So let's say you have like a symbol that represents Venus on your body. If you're doing a solo ritual, you might not want that presence. So one thing that I recommend is if your tattoo doesn't relate to the intention of what you're doing, because inherently it's going to infuse into what you're doing because it is a correspondence, to cover it with either makeup or like a bandage or something, just so that it's not like visible. Um, I really recommend concealer. I think like a Dermacol concealer, uh, though they're not sponsoring me, they should. Uh, we'll definitely get that job done because that is a correspondence that's notable and any tattoo you put on your body i think you should really consider before you put it on your body because that's going to have a lot of impacts on you metaphysically right because the act of tattooing is a blood pact in and of itself right like you're putting a symbol on yourself and you're bleeding during it it's, it's very ritualistic if you take it to that extent so any image just keep in mind that that is going to be a layer of correspondence to consider now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was jewelry. Um, jewelry during ritual is something you can really play around with and have a lot of, you know, um, fun with and get a lot of correspondences in. All stones have correspondences. There's like very complex and, you know, 8 million correspondences for all the stones. And some of them, you know, come from like more modern stuff and some are way older, right? Like I recently reread The Descent of Inanna, which is one of the most ancient poems in the world. It's, it's an epic poem from Samaria and it's really mythologically important to that tradition. And what's so interesting about it to me is Inanna is described wearing a lapis lazuli necklace, like repeatedly. And so if you were to invoke Inanna, I think it would make sense to wear a lapis lazuli necklace because one of the things that does come up repeatedly, um, and this was taught a lot in planetary magic traditions. I remember I went to a planetary magic lecture in person and they really drilled this into our head. One of the things that can help get a spirit to like you and connect with you is to embody them and sort of look like them and kind of represent them in a way. And so certain rituals will require you to kind of dress up as specific people. Um, some of the Renaissance grimoires for when you're invoking the sun will have you dress up like a king, right? Um, or if you're invoking, say, Saturn to wear a lot of black. Now, I tend to kind of make fun of the crystal girlies a little bit. I think there's a lot of watered down metaphysics going on there and I'm generally critical of it. But I'm gonna give them this. 
Crystals are a layer of correspondence. And if you wear specific crystals, it can help you connect to an intention. Do I think the crystals are as important as people make them out to be? No, but are they a valid correspondence? Yes. I remember at one point I completely crapped on the crystal thing and called it all new age. And someone actually pointed out to me that Agrippa wrote about how crystals are correspondences. So I'm going to issue my big correction there and say, yeah, I was wrong about that one. I'm going to discuss an actually polarizing thing when it comes to ritual wear. And that would be whether or not to wear your prayer beads because religions really disagree on this question like really disagree on this question. So prayer beads come in a number of different um, sort of bead number. I feel like there's gotta be a better word for that than bead number, but that, that's what I think they're called. Um, sizes, colors, and reasons. There is of course the rosary. If you live in the West, I'm sure you've seen a ton of rosaries, right? There are tons of people with them. Um, they have a specific number of beads and you're supposed to say a specific prayer when you use the rosary. There is the tispa, this is from Islam. Um, and this is a 33 or 99. Um, it's always an odd number because you always are supposed to do dikr, which is the recitation and the remembrance of a law that you would do on a tispa in an odd number. There are those. Um, there are the mala beads, which are a sort of like Eastern Vedic set of beads. Um, you see them in a number of different materials or whatever. Um, and there are other ones. Uh, a lot of people will make like custom beads for their tradition. Um, I remember I was taking class on Hakate and we had to make a specific um, prayer bead set for Hakate as a devotional thing. So prayer beads are pretty universal. They really date before modern religion. They're one of the most ancient things in the world. And interestingly, some religions you'll see people wearing them. Like I see people wearing mala beads a lot. Um, I've seen Sufis wear tispas, like just wearing them. Um, a lot of them will kind of have them in their hand and their purse and kind of finicky and like play with them and fidget with them throughout the day. Um, there are certain interviews with people where you can see them literally messing with the tispa during their interview. Um, and then the rosary, it generally is recommended to not wear the rosary. Um, some Christians actually think it's offensive to wear a rosary, but there are Christians, specifically those in Latin America, who actually do wear the rosary, like, and they're still Catholic. So that's one that they can sort out. Um, but generally, I think for Christian mysticism, you probably shouldn't wear them. Um, I wear prayer beads because I don't see them as a contradiction of what I believe. And for me, when I'm wearing the prayer beads, since my prayer beads are something that I spend so much time with virtually, they're one of my most used tools, I feel like I'm really connected to them. And so it adds a sort of spiritual like protection of sorts to me because it's something that is so directly linked to me in that way. So I like wearing mine, but I don't wear mine all the time. Um, there's some days when I just, I, I don't do it. I'm not wearing them today. Obviously, I'm just wearing like a fashion necklace, but... You know, there's definitely some benefit to that. Another debate in religion is, and it's on my head, the headscarf, to veil or not to veil. So I actually used to not get veiling. Um, I remember a couple years ago, I like, I made some dumb takes on it and I, I really thought it was not something that made sense outside of the Abrahamic religions. Um, and I didn't understand why the Abrahamic religions veiled. Um, and this is something that I was so, so, so wrong about. I wish I could issue like 8 million corrections on that because veiling is super spiritually powerful. Oh my God, there's a reason why so many religions have women specifically do it. Um, veiling is a really ancient practice that exists pretty cross-culturally. You see uh, women in ancient Greece, a lot of them veiled. Specifically, if you look at the Vestal Virgins, you almost always see them with a veil and then a flower crown when they are depicted in art. Um, you see in the pre-Islamic Arab world, there was a practice of veiling culturally. It was not as religious as it was during Islam, which obviously in Islam, the hijab, which is not just the veil, it's the whole thing. It's the covering of the, the woman, um, is pretty, pretty obligatory. Um, there are some people who dissent on that opinion, but I think it seems pretty clear that within that religion, it is something that is pretty stressed. Um, but once again, that is debatable. Um, their scholars can debate about that. And you guys can debate about that in the comments section, but that's what I've picked up. Um, you'll see Yazidis veiling and they wear this kind of like dome circular hat. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty universal. It's, it's in so many traditions, Slavic pagans veil, um, Orthodox Christians veil, Catholics veil. Um, it, it's in a lot of traditions. The big debate amongst people who veil is kind of why do you do it? Um, some people think it should only be done after marriage or after a certain age. Some people believe it should only be done when you're actually in ritual. This is how a lot of Christians feel. A lot of Christians like don't veil normally, but when they're in church, um, they do veil. So some people only veil when they pray. Some people do it constantly. Some people do it 
on specific days. Like there's a lot of debate on how this is done or how much it should cover, right? I got a lot of hair showing right now. I've got, you know, pretty significant amount of hair popping out, right? I'm not wearing the undercap. I'm not doing any of that. But some people, um, you know, do think you should cover absolutely everything. So that's something that people debate amongst each other. But the veil, it's very much a sign of humility, um, of doing something to honor the gods. And it does make you visibly religious, right? It makes you a beacon for your faith. And people will come up to you and ask you like, oh, what do you believe? And it's a really good time to discuss and honor the spirits that you um, honor. And also like a lot of specific holy places are veiled, right? You put a cloth over them. You wouldn't have an altar table without a cloth, right? So you would do that with the person who is holy. Um, as well, you do see in certain rituals it being called for just as like a temporary thing. I've seen some rituals where you start with the veil and then you take it off as part of the formula of that specific rite. Um, in terms of hats, you will see certain religions calling for men to wear certain hats or put something on their head. Um, I know in Western, like modern occultism, like in Thelema, there were some rituals where you would see it, but it wouldn't be constant. Certain religions would make it constant though during mysticism. So just keep all that in mind. It's, it's, it's a topic for debate, but it is something to consider. It's something to look into and think about what your relationship to it might be. My final point, this is the last correspondence and ritual garb thing I'm going to discuss, is perfume and scent. So during ritual, we obviously burn incense, we burn herbs, we do all this stuff. And of course we understand in ritual that that is a correspondence of, of air and fire and earth and all sorts of things. Like it's a lot of things coming together. Um, and the scent itself is very powerful. When we inhale something, when we smell something, I, I heard this in a lecture and it's really stuck with me. It sort of psychologically possesses us for a few minutes. It overtakes our senses and has a lot of control over us. And perfume does the same thing. So consider what perfume you're wearing. What, what are the herbs inside the perfume? Um, can you consecrate your perfume? Can you do so with it? Can you make your own based on specific rituals? All of that is a super potent thing. So that's my video. Please like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell. Um, if you want to see more of me, please join my Patreon. I give an extra video every month. I give a ritual guide that's over 20 pages long every single month. I meet once a month with my high tier patrons to discuss their spiritual practice in a spiritual consultation type setting. It's something I really enjoy doing. Um, and you can also find me on all platforms under the sun. I host the podcast, The Postmodern Iconoclast. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, X, Telegram, Threads. I'm really everywhere. I'll see you guys in the next one. Like, comment, subscribe. If you subscribe for 93 days, you'll meet your whole guardian angel and you'll never need to wear anything for ritual ever again. All right. See you guys in the next one. Bye.